Anyway, he picked his bike up and he noticed he's <laughs> cracked his rail on his seat. Oh my goodness. And that's the second one. And here we are, 55 k's out. <laughs> we got to ride home yet. <laughs> How many k's did we do on the busted seat? <laughs> 50. Well, I could have done, could have, could have done uh, last Sunday. Who knows? Oh, I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Just, yeah, I wouldn't know. Just, so hung in. Well, well the, front, the front part. <laughs> it's still got. Yeah. What is it? Avia, Avatar. Avatar. Yeah, the other one was the Toupee or something. Toupee or something. How's your position on your bike? Are you comfortable? Is it right for you? Now perhaps you've had a bike fit and now you want to replicate that position onto a new bike that you've bought or an existing bike that you have. Now a good bike fit prevents injuries, increases your performance and makes you comfortable for all the riding that you're going to do. And your saddle position plays a vital role in exactly that. Unfortunately, a lot of bike riders don't get their ideal position right for themselves. So, what to do? Now, this isn't a bike fit video, but I'm going to show you how you can make your own bike fit tool. And it measures height, length, tilt of the seat, amongst other measurements. Now, this is going to be really handy because you can copy any of those measurements or all of them onto another bike, basically transferring your position onto another bike. And also, you can record those measurements on paper for future reference. Two tools which are quite effective in measuring is the bubble level and the good old tape measure. Now with the tape measure, you go from A to B and you hold it with one hand and with the other hand as well and you move your head around and you eyeball the measurement. Now, unfortunately, while you're doing that quite often, this hand at the other end moves a little bit, it can be out by two or three or even four millimeters. Particularly when you measure the height, you put this end on the middle of your axle of your bottom bracket and you measure up to your seat and again while you're eyeballing this one here may not be exactly in the center of your axle and you can't see exactly where you're measuring on your seat anyhow so you can be out a fair bit. The other thing is with your seat tilt how do you measure seat tilt with a tape measure because your tape measure is bendy and you need a straight line so you can't use a tape measure for that. So you resort to the bubble level. So here's your bubble level and you put it on your seat and you eyeball it again and usually there's some marks on the glass cylinder and you can see approximately your seat tilt. And however you record it, I don't know, maybe you take a picture of it or something like that. But the other thing is this will only be effective if your floor is perfectly level. Now get your level, put it on the floor next to your back wheel and have a look and then put it next to your front wheel and have a look. Pretty much 99% of the time, the level is not going to be the same. And yes, even with concrete floors, they're quite often out. The other thing is, maybe you take a level measurement with certain tyre profiles on, say you've got two 25C tyres front and rear, then you decide to put a 28 on the rear or a 28 on the front, and your level then, your bike is slightly tilted out, of course, your seat is slightly tilted differently. So unless you replace both tyres with 28, if one is different than the other, Beware of that because that can put your measurement out as well. And of course with modern technology we've got our phones, you can download an Inclimeter app or a Bubble app and they're good because they've got digital number readouts and they're quite accurate, easy to read. So you put that on your seat, but unfortunately that's still prone to those two floors, literally the floor and the tyre profile. So you know, we need something where you can measure without the influence of levels. And one way to do that is with a straight rod, just a straight piece of rod. Uh, this is a wall bracket that you normally put on the wall and you put your brackets and you can make shelving. So it's made of aluminium, it's light and it's dead flat. And it's also not influenced by moisture in the air or temperature. So you just put that on your seat and you can see the distance between that rod and your handlebar and you measure that with a steel ruler bingo again you eyeball it and you get pretty close to the millimeter and then you can write that number down and record that now a good reason a straight rod is effective in measuring seat tilt more so than a bubble level 
is because you multiply any small difference at the seat by four. So if you move your seat, say you move the, the nose down one millimeter, at the handlebar, it'll be approximately four millimeters difference. So one millimeter difference at your seat is very difficult to see on a bubble level, whereas four millimeters up here is a lot easier to detect and to measure. So we can take that principle of a straight rod and make a tool to make various measurements, including the seat tilt. Now quite a few of you have seen in the back of some of my videos and asked previously, what's that tool hanging up and can you show us how to use it? And that's this one here. And it's exactly what it does is it has an angle and also has adjustable thing here. You plug this in into your bottom bracket and then you put that onto the position on your seat where you sit and you put that on your handlebar at the other end and you get measurements both height. You also get the tilt here angle and you get a measurement of the length all in one. And then you can transfer that over, plug it into another bike, exactly the same, and you can adjust things so that it's just so on the position on that bike you just measured. Now, this tool, unfortunately, is fairly cheap to make, but is very complicated to make in the joints. So I'm not going to show you that one because we'll be an hour making a video on just how to make it. So into this one, this is a lot easier to make, um, but unfortunately, it's not that cheap to make, but... It still works really well. So you just plug that onto the back of your seat and you can extend it and get the right measurements. Got a little adjusting thing here as well. So that's rather effective, but again, it's not easy to make. So let's make a really easy one and enter this tool. Here it is, very cheap to make and very simple to make and it does all the measurements. So this is the tool we're gonna to show you how to make for yourselves. Now for the measurements, you need to know where you're measuring from and to. And the central pivot point is your seat. Most of the measurements we take are going to be to and from your seat. Now, whereabouts on your seat? For instance, you could take the measurements from the back of your seat or from the nose of your seat or anywhere in between. Or well, actually, the true measurement is from where your sit bones are. In your pelvic area, whereabouts they are, the exact point of your sit bone on the seat, those two points. So now, if we have a look at this seat, it's a very flat sort of seat, and you put a steel rule across it, and where your sit bones are, we actually sit in here in the cradle of the seat, there's not much difference here. It's probably about six millimetre difference. Whereas if you get a seat like this one, a different shape, the tail is higher, and the nose is probably a little bit higher as well, and there's plenty of light under there. So this one, you sit more in the cradle, it's actually a lower position. So your height will be different with this seat as opposed to that seat. The other thing is whereabouts along here as this one here, you sit right back here as opposed to the nose. Whereas this one here, the widest point is almost halfway in the seat. So you see it further up and the tail's way back. So you have to know whereabouts you sit on the seat. When riding, your sit bones support about 80 to 90% of your weight. Ever notice when you're going hard, putting out the power, that you hardly notice your seat at all, especially if you normally do? That's because you're unweighting yourself from your seat more by pushing harder on your pedals. You're taking some of the weight off of your seat and putting it through your pedals. In effect, you're floating on your seat rather than sitting. But whereabouts do your sit bones perch on your saddle? About here. Find the widest part of your saddle. A caliper is a good way of doing this. Coming back from the nose, when your caliper reaches the beginning of the widest part of your seat, draw a line across the seat at that point. Approximately five to seven millimeters in front of that line is where your sit bones carry the majority of the 80 to 90% of your weight onto the seat. And we can see this is the case with real time pressure mapping. Now we know approximately where along our saddle we sit, we also need to find the width of our sit bones. So your sit bone width is one of the most important measurements you can make. Now, unless you're under 15 years of age or 65 and over, your sit bone width ain't gonna change. So let's measure it. All you need is some alfoil, this sort of stuff, aluminum alfoil, and a hard chair or a side table. And this is a piece of flooring foam, which I recommend because it's relatively firm, but still soft. So it's sort of a pattern on one side and it's smooth on the other. 
So if you haven't got a piece, go out and buy yourself a piece because it will still be worth it just to know your sit bone width. So put that on top of the hard chair or table and then cut yourself a piece of foam just enough so you can sit on it. Back a square and lay it on the edge and then you sit on it. Smooth out the wrinkles so it's relatively smooth, don't have to be fanatical about it. And grab the sides of the table or your chair and then lean forward a bit and you'll feel your sit bones digging in a bit and you can just move side to side a bit. Don't lean back because you don't do that on the bike anyway, you lean forward. So we want the frontal area of your sit bone, the pointy area. Wobble back and forth a little bit like that as well. And lift your legs maybe. That'll do. You can lift yourself straight up, straight up and off. You should get two definite circles. So outline their perimeter with a marker and then put a dot in the middle of each circle. And measure the distance between the dots and write it down. Don't rely on just one measurement, repeat the process three or four times and then take the average. Here's my four measurements, add them up and then divide them by four and you've got 111. So that's my sit bone width, what about you? And here's an excellent way of finding where your sit bones sit on your seat in real terms. Using blue tack or plasticine, put a bit on the nose and one bit on each side of your seat. Then put a sheet of alfoil on your seat and conform it to the shape of your seat and the blue tack will hold it in place. Give it a bit of a smooth with the soft edge on both sides, that way you don't have any deceiving marks. Carefully plonk your bottom straight down on the seat and go for a spin on your home trainer for a couple of minutes. Preferably use a low gear, that means you spin a bit faster and you put a bit more weight on the back of your seat and sit up a bit more, don't lean right over. Once you've finished, lift yourself straight up and off of your seat. Then look carefully for the indentations in the alfoil of your sit bones. It's difficult to see here, we can just make out one of them on this side. Put a dot in the middle of each sit bone circle. I'm putting two dots here because the centre of the circle isn't that clear. But this side I can definitely see where the centre is. Use a straight rule to match the dots. I know the left marker is a definite where my sit bone is, so it must be the lower of the two marks because otherwise the line would be diagonal across the seat. And I definitely don't sit like that. So that front marker is correct and there's the straight line. And using a caliper again, move it back to the beginning of the widest part of your seat and you can see that difference of five mil or so between your sit bone line and the caliper. Carefully lift the alfoil off the nose of the seat, remove the blue tack or plasticine and then form the alfoil back over the nose again. These first two measurements are not vital but they're handy to know. Distance between your sit bone line and the nose of your seat. Then you can also measure from your sit bone to the back of the seat. And finally the all important width of your sit bone. Now because your sit bone points are just so important to remember, get a piece of chalk and sharpen the end and then press and twist on your sit bone spots. Remove the aluminium alfoil and voila, you've got your sit bone points actually marked on your seat. Now take a real good look at all different angles because this is where your sit bones sit on your seat. Now that you know your sit bone width, you can make a template which is easy to use on any seat and it's much quicker and easier to use than a ruler. You'll also need the template for using with the quick fit tool that we're going to make. You can use a kitchen spatula, a putty scraper or almost any piece of plastic that's flat. Mark your sit bone width on it and then cut out a skinny rectangle at that width. 
file off any burrs and then mark a halfway line along its length. Then using a sharp blade or a hacksaw blade, cut exactly on that line. That way the line is a permanent fixture. And then on the back of it you can write your sit bone width, in my case 111 millimeters. So now you know the width of your sit bones and you have a physical template of that width that you can place it on any seat and know exactly where your sit bones are going to be. Now it's time to make this main tool for yourself, so let's rip into it. So here are the things you need. A piece of aluminium square rod, 19mm in size, 1m in length. A J-bolt, so it's a hook with a thread on it, then a washer to fit on and a wing nut to fit that thread. 20 millimeter PVC joiner that is available from the plumbing section of your hardware store. 13 millimeter poly T available from the gardening section of your hardware store. Polypropylene clear vinyl tubing it says to fit 19 millimeter tubing, but it's more likely the inside diameter average about 23. So the important thing is it's clear and it's squishy. An offcut of garden hose, just ordinary garden hose that you've got lying around. A small nut and a bolt, nothing in particular. A chair end with a thread on or a knob with a thread on and a flat nut to fit on that thread. This is a chair end, square plastic chair end, and that fits in the end of your rod there, the square rod, just to make it look nice. A French valve, don't cut and go cutting off your new tube, but uh, any old punctured tube will do. Just cut off the valve, two nuts and a brightly coloured or a clear valve cap on that. A cheap plastic caliper, available from eBay, you can get them anywhere. And last of all, adhesive tape measure or measuring tape. This is a metric one and it's fairly skinny. Don't get too wide because you've got to stick it along your aluminium rod. And if you were to buy all these items, it shouldn't cost any more than about $35. Now with the 13mm poly T we want that to go into the hose easily but at the moment it's a bit tight so we need to file that barb end off so get a file and file that off. Go all the way around nice and evenly. Right so that should slip on nicely and pull off nicely. It will be hard but you don't want it too loose just right. Now we want one of the other arms of the poly T to go into the cap of your left hand crank arm. It's not going in, so you need to file some of that barb off. So go around and evenly file that until it just fits in, just nicely. Don't make it too loose and don't make it too tight, just like that. Something interesting here is an old Tegra crank set as well, R8000, but it's two or three years older than the other crank set and the cap's a different size. It's a little bit harder to push this piece in. So just be aware of that. Not all these crank caps are the same size. Now get your piece of hose and it needs to go into the end of your aluminium rod, but this one's a little bit tight. So what you can do to help it get in, just file a little bit off, bevel the end of the hose. I've already done it. So it's just slightly beveled, you can hardly see it, and it just goes in nicely. So push that in, that's level with the end, just like that. And you'll find your T piece should just go in nicely. Just sits in there, like that. If you find that your piece of hose keeps slipping out of or into the rod, then just glue it in. Just cheap super glue will do the trick. Now get your J-bolt and put it into the T-piece, putting the hook end down on the end where you fold away to fit the crank cap. Then put the washer on top and the wing nut on top of that. Now on the other end of the rod, you want your 20mm coupling piece to slide on the rod, but it's not. If your coupling has a flange in the middle like this one, stopping all four corners of the rod from going through, well, file it out. Eventually, you want it to slide along the rod like this. 
Now start with drilling a small pilot hole right in the middle of the coupling. Now with a slightly bigger drill bit, drill all the way through, straight through to the other side. So you have a hole on each side directly opposite each other. Now the small bolt is going to hold your clear plastic tube to the coupling. The bolt needs to be between 8 to 10 millimeters in length. If it's too long, then cut it. Then square off the end and file off any rough edges. Hold the coupling so that the holes are horizontal, then mark the clear plastic tube at the height of a hole. Drill the mark with a small drill bit, and then with a slightly larger drill bit so that the bolt just fits through. Then the same with one of the holes on your coupling so that the bolt just fits through. Now turn the coupling over to the other hole, secure it in a vise, and then drill that hole slightly larger, and then larger again until the thread on the knob fits just through the hole nicely. For the knob, the thread needs to be 10 millimeters long. If it's any longer, then cut it at 10 millimeters. File the end flat and any burrs that are sticking out. For the nut, bevel two of its edges and the four corners. So get the nut from the knob and lock it onto the J bolt there. And then you can just file the edge of the nut. So the nut ends up looking like this. When inserting the nut into the coupling, make sure the beveled edges face inwards and also that the beveled edges face lengthways along the rod. Loosen the knob and insert the rod. If the coupling is grabbing on the rod like this, you'll need to file a bit more out of the coupling. Once you've got the coupling moving freely along the rod and then when you do the knob up, it doesn't move at all, done. So we're halfway into making the tool and as you can see it's easy to make. Now to finish off the tool and show you how to use it would make this video way too long. So we'll do that in the next video. So we'll see you there. Here's gone one side boring area. That side's okay but this side has gone all collapsed. I'm stealing the seat. <laughs> My mechanic skills, yes. <laughs> so the seat's on and loose. Now the first thing we want to do is measure the length. Crack! <laughs> ten. Ten Newton meters. Ten Newton meters. <laughs> nice and smooth. <laughs> Tip. In crocs. In crocs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.